Okay, so one thing that was never discussed was that in 1972, after the Laurel Langley Agreement expired, and the Laurel Langley Agreement was that all businesses in the Philippines had to have a 60% Philippine ownership. So if you were an American business and you were in the Philippines, you had to sell 60% of your business to a local Filipino. And Ferdinand Marcos took advantage of this and became the owner of a lot of businesses in the Philippines. But one thing he did was he took over the entire mining industry in the Philippines. This is all the gold, copper, silver, whatever mining there was in the Philippines. He took it over. Like I said, the Philippines should be the fifth richest country in the world with all the mineral resources it has. And the good thing is it still has enough where if there was a wide scale mining operation and the people were uh, paid properly and the money was reinvested into the country, the Philippines would be the richest country in the world. So he took over the gold, silver, copper mines that were, and everything was under Marcos' control. So Marcos then made a law that said that all the gold in the country had to be sold to the central bank. So in a sense, what Marcos did was he took over the mines, all the gold that was mined in those mines, he sold to the Philippine government and made 60% of that money. So say he sold a million dollars worth of gold to the Philippine government, he made $600,000 off that sale. Then he turned around and got loans on that million dollars. So he wound up making money double fisting it. But here's another interesting thing. And I've, I've said this, uh, I've said this a little bit. Uh, the Philippines should, I mean, between 1974 and 1978, so 74, 75, 76, 77, so four years, not one ounce of gold was deposited into the central bank. So Fernandez Marcos and his cronies were actually selling all their gold outside of the country. And uh, this is when, right after 72, he started to talk about finding Yamashita's gold. So now he had, had to make an excuse of how he was making so much gold, how he was getting so much gold, how he was getting so wealthy. So he just started to talk, he discovered Yamashita's gold. And like I said, if true, and with all the mining minerals, deposits, and everything in the Philippines. The Philippines should be a very rich country. So the IMF disco uh, discovered during the Marcos area that the Philippine uh, Central Bank overprinted currency. So it means they just say there's a billion dollars worth of gold in the, the vaults. They should have a billion dollars worth of currency out there. But they overprinted it and it could not be backed up by the gold deposits in the Central Bank. And the governor, uh, Fernandez, allowed this. Jolo, Jobo Fernandez allowed it. And so they had this, the, the uh, peso notes all had the same serial number. And there was a lot of overspending in 85 to 86, which Marcos wanted to be reelected. Re and he lost that election, by the way. And that's when he abdicated and was forced out of the country. So the bank, central banks could not show how much money was printed and issued during this time period. And they would not release the information to the IMF. So Pimentel then discovered that Marcos allowed a charter to be added to the central bank. Uh, the saying that the governor of the central bank could sell any gold reserves that it deemed necessary. So they could just take the gold out of the Philippine bank, I mean central bank, and just sell it to anybody anyone, anyone they want, without permission or knowledge of the Congress. So basically, he could steal it, sell it, and keep the money, and nobody would know. And Fernandez, Jolo Fernandez, the banker, was criticized for di not divesting himself of the shares of the Far East Bank. So he actually was getting shares of the banks that was uh, causing conflict of interest but while he was... Uh, uh, director of the central bank. Uh, so basically, while he was doing that, the central bank and the Far East Bank were making loans to people, and he wound up, it would be a conflict of interest with some of these loans. 
So Marcos, after 86, was desperate to return to the Philippines. He wanted to become the Philippine leader again, and he wanted to overthrow Cory Quisino. So reportedly, in 1988, he had a talk with the uncle of President Kino, Kong Nan Sumalong, and Coruscant's cousin, Ding Tanguanko. Now, these were very powerful families. And these are very rich families in the Philippines. And Marcos knew it, and they knew they had influence. So he had to talk to them. And so he tried to win Corazon's blessings to allow him to return to the Philippines. Now, he may have wanted to overthrow her when he got there because there was a story, and I'll get into that, that they paid people to overthrow her. But what he wanted to do was he was going to return $15 billion to the Philippine economy or to the Philippine government to help pay the debt, uh, work on the infrastructure, and he was going to get another additional $5 billion to the Aquino family for, uh, just for the death of Ninoy Aquino. And the Philippine government and the families believed that Marcos, if he was going to offer $20 billion, had more money, and they rejected the offer. So Alan Weinstein from the Center of Democracy visited Marcos in the middle of 1988 and was surprised that Marcos offered to transfer all the monies to the Philippine government without any conditions or anything just to prove his sincerity of remorse and willingness to help the Philippine people who he loved. When the report was leaked to the media, somehow it got released. Marcos stated that he never made that offer, and it was not true. So on October 21st, 1988, the U.S. federal grand jury, so the grand jury in the United States is before they go to trial, where they show all the evidence to the jury and say, this is what we have. Do we have enough evidence to press charges? So they indicted Ferdinand and Melda Marcos for $268 million racketeering scheme, uh, siphoning off the Philippine Treasury and... 103 million and defrauding U.S. banks of 165 million. And on November 3rd, Amelda returned to Hawaii after Doris Duke, an actress and uh, tobacco heir, and according to Amelda, uh, paid, and Muammar Gaddafi paid her $5 million bail. So she had a lot of Hollywood people, even George uh, Clooney, I think it was. No, it wasn't George Clooney. But they all came to her aid and testified for her. So later that year, Marcos, the Marcos is interviewed by lawyers trying to determine how much money they stole and laundered through the Philippines. And during this time, they pleaded the fifth. The fifth is saying that if you talk, you will, you might prove you're guilty. So you refuse to talk and you have this right. And you don't have to talk. If you say, I plead the fifth, you do no longer have to talk. As long as you say, I plead the fifth to every single question you ask. Once you answer a question, you no longer can plead the fifth. So they'll ask you, hey, this is a nice shirt, where do you get it? If you say, at Macy's, you lost. So you have to say, I plead the fifth. So they pleaded, pleaded, the, fifth, pleaded the fifth at least 200 times. During In 1988, the United States filed charges against the Marcos families for racketeering and defrauding the U.S. and Filipino banks. Likewise, the Philippine government charged the Marcos Similar charges, but they dropped them when the Marcuses returned real estate holdings and assets to, to the United States. So the Philippine government was actually pressed charges, but they returned assets to the Philippine government. Uh, Imelda gave an interview with the Philippine Daily Inquirer in 1988, where she claimed Ferdinand had claimed he, he had 4,000 tons of gold during his reign. This is just crazy. 4,000 tons of gold is unheard of. Now, the Philippine government, now let's just put it this way. The Philippine government at the time was mining about four tons of gold a year. Vernon Dan was in power from like 69 to just say 86, so 17 years. That would be 68 tons of gold. Plus, if you turn around and you add like 20 tons of gold from Roger Roja, we're talking 83 tons of gold. And then there was another 20 tons of gold so about 100 tons of gold is about all it could have been. 
So at the time, at $300 an ounce, that would be about $38.4 billion. And actually, this is more gold than reported in Fort Knox. So the 4,000 tons, probably not happening. South Africa mines 400 tons of gold a year. At 400 times, that would be over uh, 10 years. The Philippines, it would be... Uh, a thousand years worth of gold mining so I don't believe it would work but then again he did own mines so that hundred tons taken from the US I mean the Philippine Central Bank could be more like four or five hundred tons because if he didn't report all the gold being uh, sent to the Central Bank and he sold it, it could be a lot more it could be two three hundred tons so this would make the Marcos family the richest private family in the world and uh, she, Amelda claimed that he built roads, bridges, and schools for the Philippines. He actually did put electricity in a lot of places like in Il Ilocos Norte. He did put electricity in there. And a lot of people moved the economy up a little bit. But I don't believe it was... If you put Back then, if you put $12 billion in an economy, you would have huge roads and everything. He did try to make a film industry in the Philippines. And if you go down Rojas Boulevard you will see a nice building on the ocean side where it's like the Philippine uh, movie section. <laughs> uh, and she said all the money was, gold was sold and to help rebuild the infrastructure of the Philippines. And she claimed the, the family was worth $11 billion, but kept no funds that were illegally obtained. <laughs> so, so she went on to state that during the husband's administration, he had amassed now here's she's changing the story now, so she he amassed most of the, all the big businesses in the Philippines through financial business partnerships, and she stated her husband owned Philippine Airlines, an Asian brewery, the Manila Tribune, and Allied Banking, and she wanted them back. She wanted them back. So another so that was it. So she said that she made money from. Trading gold, then she made he made money getting the big businesses, which is probably the truth on that one with the Laurel Langley agreement coming through. And another interview in Hawaii, in Hawaii, she told reporters that Marcos made his money through real estate. Changed her story again. She changed. She they said they purchased land in Ilocos Norte for one peso. I like to know where you get land for one peso, and they sold it for four hundred fifty pesos. I don't think she bought land for one peso. She stated that they purchased some land for 50 centavos and then sold it for hundreds of pesos. So she, she I think her, she was just, just talking. And then she stated that companies were given to allies of her husband, were, they were given to part of the profits to the family, saying that Marcos owned these businesses and she all but said he got bribes and kickbacks. And for Marcos not to be on the paperwork of the companies like Philippine Airlines, uh, they he was part owner, but they gave him money and didn't have anything written down. She just said they didn't want the nation to discover the amount of money that her family was obtaining. So between 1965 and 1984, they claimed to have 6.75 million pesos or $337,000 in income. And then she claimed that 67, her husband gave control of Asia Brewery, Philippine Airlines, Allied Bank, and to Lucio Tan. And then she went on to call him a bottle collector before they met him. And <laughs> she claimed that uh, the Kuanko family received uh, numerous business businesses. And she said, I'm going to sue all these people to get my ownership back. And uh, they better return them to her because she owned them. So... She had no proof of owning all these businesses except for a few stocks. So the Kuanko family stated they would just see her in court. And the government claimed, you don't have any proof of ownership, so we're not even going to look into it. So one of the um, companies that she stated in the news she wanted back was Manila Electric Company. And it was purchased from the Lopez family. I kind of went into this, but let me go into it more. So prior to the revolution, and it was, I mean, after the revolution, it was returned to the family after Corazon Aquino. The Lopez family stated that during his administration, 
Ferdinand Marcus blackmailed the family into selling the company to the Marcos family. Now, this is one of the companies that was 100% Philippine owned, so it could not be part of the Laurel Langley agreement where Marcos could get 60% of the business or a kickback. It was 100% owned and he could have nothing with that company. So what he did was he arrested Eugenio, the oldest son, and refused to allow him out of prison. So basically they kidnapped him until the Marcos family was sold the electric company. Now Marcos didn't come out flat out say it himself. He would have some of his cronies come in and say, here, he, he, the, the police chief, he's not getting out of prison unless you sell the company to Ferdinand Marcos. So the family finally agreed to it and there was a $200 or 10,000 peso at the time deposit on the electric company. So Marcos gave 10,000 pesos and said, okay, this is the down payment. But at the same time, they finally transferred the money, I mean, transferred the company with uh, no payment. And so after Marcos got the company, he never paid the rest. Eugenio eventually escaped prison and with the help of Frank Chavez, a lawyer, he flew to Hong Kong and Steve Pinson says the newspaper reporter, they all helped him. So he flew to Hong Kong and the United States and declared political asylum. So every time she was asked about how Ferdinand Marcos made his fortune, her story changed. Uh, so she said Fernanda was obsessed with owning all the foreign businesses in the Philippines when the Laurel Langley Agreement was going to expire. When it, it expired, all the foreign companies sold, business, sold businesses and he wound up becoming 60% of the holdings of all those companies. In another interview, I'm going to redo that, she made it, he made it through Yamashita's Gold. And again, she said that he made 40,000 tons of gold, metric tons. So we're talking um, 44,000 pounds of gold or 44 tons, 1,000 tons of gold. And this, if this is really true, this would make the family worth $1.1 trillion. That's how much that gold is worth today. So she had to testify uh, about her knowledge. And then she stated, oh, in court, when they were saying, how much money did you make? Where did Ferdinand make the money? Now, she's already gone on record saying gold, gold, selling Biden, selling gold, Yamashita's gold, owning all the ownership businesses in the Philippines. Uh, real estate. Now she says, well, I don't know how he made his money. I was just his wife. So she went on to say that Tan Benedicto and the Cuanca family paid billions of pesos in kickbacks and bribes and to secret accounts with Fernandan Marcos. And these were under the names William Sanders and Jane Ryan, which was her alias. So she actually had a bank account, Jane Ryan. And, uh, they were putting money into those accounts. And this was to secure businesses in the Philippines and they were bribes and kickbacks. So when Ferdinand Marcos obtained over 4,000, 1,000 tons of gold. So 1,000 tons is probably stretching it. 200 tons probably would be more accurate. So this, she said he had, now she's saying he had 1,000, but before she's saying he had 40,000. So it can't, Probably not a thousand, maybe 200 tons would probably sound right because South Africa, like I said, mines 4, 400 tons of gold and the Philippines is four tons, but it can go as high as 12 tons. So the interview with her was supposed to run in a span of two weeks in the newspaper, Philippine Inquirer, but however, they stopped it because she said she'd been starting to receive some death threats. And... Amy, I know, I think Bomb Bomb Bomb, they, they said she gets carried away and starts bragging about stuff that aren't even true. And sometimes you have to ignore what she says and just laugh. This is what her children are saying about her. So Bomb Bomb went to argue that if there were tunnels in the Philippines loaded with gold, how come no one has found them? And then he contradicted his mother's testimony, stating that he'd never seen gold. Well, I don't know about Bong Bong, but I know he may not have seen gold, but he knows about the billion dollar bank accounts. So after the revolution, B.F. Goodrich made it public. Now I'm just gonna go back to this. They made a public statement about the dealings with the Marcoses 
In the 1980s, they wanted to enter the Philippine economy selling tires. And there was an, a Philipp, a, an, already a company in the Philippines that was selling tires. And at the time, there was about a 55 million person population. I thought it was 27. But with the numerous amounts of shakedowns and bribes, they were unable to sell tires in the country. Everywhere they took, when they wanted to open a section up, they had to pay a bribe here. She had to pay a bribe there. So according to Fred Whiting, former president of the American Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines, he was an executive of a Malaysian-owned tire company, and he drew up plans for tire sales in the Philippine National Oil Company. So they were going to sell tires at their gas stations. He was told that in order to get the contract, they had to pay 15% commission to Geronimo Velasco, the energy commissioner under Marcos. So they not only did they have to pay taxes, they had to pay 15% of their profits to the energy commissioner. And he said that the PNOC, the Philippine Energy Commission, uh, would own 38% of the Goodrich affiliates. Now, say 100%. Say they're paying 10% tax and now to 90%. They had to pay 38% to the PNOC, which would give them 52%. And now they had to pay... 15% to Marcos. Now they're down to about 37%. So all their profits are pretty much eaten away. And Goodrich said, no, we're not going to pay that and left the country. So the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Policies Act, there's a, a, an act in the United States, a law in the United States that says American businesses and citizens cannot pay bribes to foreign nations in order to have preferential treatment or doing business in that nation. So if B.F. Goodrich actually paid bribes, they would have been breaking U.S. federal law. So when this came to light, the Philippine Commission of Good Government and the U.S. government began to look into American business to see if all the business that did business in the Philippines complied with the act of this law, so saying they didn't pay any bribes. And Many of them may have in order to comply and work with Marcos and be able to get businesses in the Philippines. So it was believed that Velasco had holdings that ranged from the Bataan Refining Corporation, the Yulo Ranch Corporation, and the cattle operations 100 square miles managed by the King Ranch Company in Texas, Australia. When the revolution occurred, the, they left the nation... Uh, okay, so... <laughs> Velasco was one of the bankers in the Philippines, and so he left um, he left the country on an Air PNLC jet and flew to San Francisco, but later disappeared. His activities this time became under security uh, scrutiny by the PCGG during the initial investigations to see if he embezzled money. So before Christmas of 1988, Marcos was again trying to raise cash to obtain loans. He was actually... Um, hurting for money because all his assets were squeezed but he was trying to find out a way to get money but people were coming in and giving him ten thousand dollars a year a hundred thousand year they were taking money out from his assets say like there was a house in los angeles for example or new york because he owned properties that were rented out so that money would be funneled to him so yes enzo zobel and we'll bring him up later on to, in the here who helped them smelt gold in the Philippines for a $250 million loan. I don't know why he would need $250 million. I mean, at this point in time, he probably was looking for five, ten thousand just to be able to pay bills and eat. And Zobel told him he didn't have that kind of money and how he would repay $250 million. And he needed some kind of collateral for the $250 million. So Mar Marco sent his nurse, Teresa Gallego, to bring him a folder. And upon receiving the folder, Marcos opened it. And uh, it was nearly two inches stack of certificates for gold that was stored in banks throughout the world. So he showed them all these gold certificates. Uh, and these include Bahamas, Monaco, Switzerland, Vatican. So... Zobel believed that these certificates probably were genuine because he helped them smelt gold. And after the gold was smelted, they uh, 
were sent all over the world. The goal was, and he was an Air Force pilot in the Philippine Air Forces, and he heard stories about cargo planes from the Philippines being flown around the world, taking gold with it. So while in top pay and on an economic mission, uh, Nandang Pendrosa, the son of former finance secretary Robert Kurzak, was trying to sell gold certificates for 50 metric tons of gold. Interested in the sale and curious that it be part of the stolen of the Philippines by Marcos, he and his partner, Abraham Dogger, were invited to Manila. Dogger was the businessman who tried unsuccessfully to help the Philippines years early in Operation Big Bird to recover stolen gold and cash from the Philippines. In the United States, America uh, found Marcos State liable for killing anti-Marcos uh, Gong Veros and Silong Domingos. The families were awarded $15 million for the death during the trial of the people who were protesting. Now, there was a, a big wave. I think it was called the wave back in the early 1970s where they protested Marcos. And Marcos used hoses. I mean, he violently cracked down on these student protesters. And they testified how they had to escape the Philippines and go into exile and to stop themselves from being uh, killed by the president. There's even one story where Aini was questioned by one of the protesters how she was in charge of the anti-human uh, uh, abuses in the Philippines, the human abuse thing in the Philippines. And the person who questioned her, because how can you be protesting your father and be in charge of this when your father's doing this? So it winds up the girl who questioned Amy wound up being killed. So this is one of the people that were killed during this time. All right, so we'll come back.